thank you so much for the time today. Always a pleasure. Nice to chat with you again. Yes, yes. Great to talk to you. So, so I'm curious for starters, when you come up with a new idea for show, in this case, universe, you know, what, what, what's the building blocks of putting that together for you? It's, um, it's, it's a long process actually, because we, um, we'd, you know, we've made cosmology series before and it's essentially a cosmology series. And, um, there are certain things in that series that you, you need to cover. Um, for example, uh, stars, right? So stars, I've made a lot of films about stars. <laughs> so one of the starting points is we're going to talk about the universe. Stars are an essential part of the evolution of the universe. Um, but we didn't want to tell the same old story. Well, not the same old story. It's an interesting story, but it's a story we told before. So um, for that, we thought, for a long time. And I had this idea that it's it's interesting to look at the first stars in the universe. They're, they're very different from the stars that we see today. It's huge things because the universe was much denser, essentially. So big, short-lived supergiants. And then there will be less stars in mm. the universe. So immediately, um, we had a, a, an arc that, that we liked. So can we tell the story of the universe from the first star to the last star? Um, and of course, within that, then there are interesting ideas are raised in the audience's mind. I mean, first of all, that the universe has a finite lifetime, it's certainly in terms of complex structures, as, as far as we can tell, um, the universe is going to continue to expand forever. And therefore, um, other than black holes, which will be lived for a very long time, the, 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 the you know, the, the, there won't be much left after um, the last red dwarf fades away. And so um, that, that's a, an example, I think, of how, you know, you know in a cosmology series what subjects, broadly speaking, you want to cover. And, and the, the interesting thing, the creative thing, is to find a different ways of telling those stories and package them together. And I should say the other thing that was interesting about this series was it was filmed in really difficult circumstances because it was filmed during lockdown. It was filmed mm. during COVID. And so that changed... Um, we didn't have complete freedom to just say, you know, usually we'd say, well, we have this big series. Um, we will film in the best place in the world to illustrate some particular idea. But because we were constrained, we, um, I think in particular, the film about galaxies really um, benefited intellectually from the restriction mm -hmm. because we decided it became clear it was right at the height, height of the pandemic. And we were able to film on, on the Isle of Skye in Northern mm. Scotland, uh, which is a beautiful place. And so from the idea, we, we, the idea came that, well, galaxies are, are islands in a sense. In one sense, they're, they're very much like islands. They, they evolve on short timescales uh, in a completely isolated way, pretty much. Mm. So... They're, they're, they're islands of stars pretty much disconnected from the wider universe. But over much longer timescales, then galaxies interact. And the story of a galaxy, in particular the Milky Way, which we are beginning to unravel now from the data from the Gaia satellite in particular, um, mm -hmm. the story of the Milky Way is one of interaction over very long timescales with other galaxies. So catastrophic events. Mm -hmm. And so we it, it fit beautifully with the idea that we filmed virtually all of that film on a single island because an island like that of course it, it, over geological time scales its its evolution is intertwined with the evolution of the planet but over short time scales they're isolated and so and from that actually we um were became interested in the john dunn poem you know the no man is an island uh, which i actually quote in the film huh. so we, we ended up with another dimension <laughs> which is um yeah, a, a quite a human a human dimension to it. There, there, there are there's almost a well, I suppose it is. It's a political statement in there. Right? There's a statement about how no one is an island and everybody mm. evolves together. And so that 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 thread came into it as a in parallel with the story of the galaxy, the Milky Way in that case. So that that was another another example. So th those are two examples of how you you try to find different ways of telling the stories. Of, of the universe 
Well, I love one of the moments I love, and, and you kind of wrap up with it at the end too, is is the Parker Solar Probe. Uh, you know, in, in the scheme of science today, is this one of the most exciting things to have come about in the last several years? Because the the research and the implications and the knowledge being gained is tremendous, or it, it seems like it. Yeah, um, th that's probe. You know, being able to um, essentially. Well, as they say, it's, it's, the, it's the Parker Solar Probe team's line that they, they're going to touch a star um, is, I think, a beautiful line. And, and it's easy, I think, again, to assume that we know everything about the sun mm -hmm. and about the stars because it's, it's been widely studied. It's close by in, in cosmic <laughs> terms. And yet there's a great deal we don't understand, of course, about its atmosphere and the interactions in its atmosphere. And then, uh, and, and actually, you've touched on another one of the kind of underlying um, artistic themes in the series, which is we wanted to focus on the missions that are telling us these these great stories. And then, of course, at the end of the films, we we interview scientists, and that's a part of the a part of the series, the scientists that are working on the probes. Um, so it again, that that was when you're thinking about stars, it was. A, as you said, a very exciting mission, which is going literally, it's flying through the sun's atmosphere. So it is in a very real sense touching the sun. Um, and and it was, it, it felt like that little, it, it's kind of a symbol for the, and it, it, it's the journey, it's the journey to, to mm -hmm. into the unknown to try to acquire new knowledge about the universe. And the probes sim uh, I think come to symbolize that in each film, mm -hmm. the probes are, become characters. I mean, the stars film is it interesting. It's uh, it's um, it became like a to, to our surprise in a way. It sort of became like a hymn. It became mm. quite a. Uh, we, we had this idea um, early on that the director uh, Ashley Gething is a uh, is more well known actually for directing um, arts films and history films, and he's tremendously well read. Um, and he knows he's directed Shakespeare, and so he has a Shakespeare quote for everything. And um, so, we, in talking together, we came up with this idea that stars, I say it in the film, that they're, they're 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 gods in a sense, right? In 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 a particular definition of the word, because they are, it, on many levels, the creators of complexity in the universe. Not not only the kind of well-known idea that they they create the building blocks, you know, the carbon and oxygen and so on. But also in a rather less well-known idea, in a thermodynamic sense, they're the they're the the fires in the steam engines of the universe. So without hot spots in the sky, um, work can't be done, things, complexity can't be built. Um, so so this idea that they're creators and ultimately destroyers, that they're mortal. They're mortal gods, and we got very interested in lots of bits of Shakespeare um, around those ideas that, that didn't actually make it into the film. We had uh, some Macbeth quotes in the film at one point, but um, it was felt it was felt we'd overdone the. Um, <laughs> we 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 drifted into art cinema territory, and we kind of as we kind of did a bit actually looking back on it because it, it was broadcast quite a few months ago now in the UK, and um, there are much more scientifically dense films in the in the mm. series particularly the one on black holes which is what i'm my own research is into at the moment um but that one is it's kind of almost looking back on it it is a it's quite a bold film because it is it, it's not only a science documentary it's kind of an impressionistic film as well and it has this gentleness to it um and i i i like that but it was ultimately it's quite a bold film to put out first i think because it's not the most scientifically dense by any means. You know, we've got a film on black holes and a film on um, essentially on inflationary cosmology, um, on on the, the really cutting edge science on the on the you know the ripples in the cosmic microwave background and how they emerged from uh, inflation um, the, as far as our best theory is concerned. So that was kind of it's you know it was it's interesting. It's an interesting film. I, I really like it. But it, it almost went in, we could almost put it out in black and white, you know, it almost drifted into the, <laughs> like it became a David Lynch film or something. <laughs> we, got, we got holed back a little bit with the Macbeth quotes. We had the, we had a quote at the end that, um, you know, the, 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 
the, the futile nature of existence, a, a story, you know, the famous quote, a story told by an idiot filled with sound and fury, signifying nothing. And we changed it at the end to signifying everything. So this story told, by, you know, full of sound and fury, the stars, but actually it signifies everything. All meaning in the universe is created by these things. And so we had that at the end at one point, and then we were, I think we were talked out of it by more conservative forces. <laughs> Well, I mean, so I want to talk about your tour in a second, but before I get to that, that does bring up something else I wanted to ask is that I think for a lot of people looking at the universe and galaxies and science as a whole, it can, it can lend a sense of almost gloom in the sense of it, it can feel you, you feel like a speck in the middle of such a huge void. And what I love about this was that watching it, it felt like it gives so much hope about this grand complex machine you're you're inside of. And, you know, you were talking about stars as engines and everything else. So, you know, I'm curious for you, is that ever something you think about when you're making this? Is that part of the conversation? Oh, yeah. It suffuses that film. I mean, it was it was all the whole motivation for the film, the way it's constructed, was heading towards that, those last lines about meaning in the universe. Um, it, as, uh, this is, as you said, part of my tour as well. It's something that I think about a lot, that meaning exists in the universe, clearly, self-evidently, because the universe means something to us, right? So consciousness exists here on this planet, but it's temporary. And, and that question, I think last time I spoke to you, I said that that question of, of, of what does it mean to live a, 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 fr a finite, fragile life in an infinite, eternal universe is central to cosmology. At the moment you think about cosmology, you have to face that question. And that film faced it, I think, head on, deliberately. Mm -hmm. And um, it's really interesting, actually. The, I mean, I'm really interested to see what happens in Canada, because in the UK, it really split audiences which we knew it would i mean it, it it's not a it's not a normal science documentary i don't think that first film and uh, and some people found it profoundly powerful and and understood it some people um some some people press reviewers who you think might try to look more deeply just missed it completely hmm. and just thought just missed that whole texture which is clearly what the film's about as i said it's almost like a hymn it's it's a it's 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 a meditation on the finite nature of existence. That's what it is. Using the stars as a as a metaphor, and uh, it was just a bit too much for some people, I think. So it was, which is great. You know, that's you know that we, we myself and the director and the series producer, we loved that because we thought, well, at least we made something that caused a conversation. <laughs> well, I love I love the idea too. Often that that true art is going to conflict people. That there's going to be people who will love certain aspects and find other parts, you know, not not as positive for them. Maybe. But yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I think the, the, there are different kinds of um, uh, people. Call them science fans, but just people who are interested in science. There are different kinds of people. So there are people for whom they love the black hole film. In, in the in the series because it is it's really cutting edge science it it goes right in there Hawking radiation the information paradox holography mm. holography you know all the things those really cool things so so some people like to watch a science documentary and get that stuff um but even then even then actually we filmed um in an abbey at some point and talks about the ashes of the universe and things so even we got a bit morose even in that film but um but yeah uh, but stars is i think a film that um it, it at least it's an attempt to to operate on on different levels and there are there's certainly an emotional and philosophical level to it and um you know some some people missed that and some people loved it <laughs> so I, yeah the well, music actually is really important. The, the music was made by um, uh, Hans Zimmer's group, a, a group called Bleeding Fingers, and they mm -hmm. um, they really put a lot of time into it. And mm -hmm. and I think the soundtrack was was really beautiful, actually. It's phenomenal. I, I loved every everything about it. Uh, oh, thank in you. terms I'm, of I'm your glad tour. You I'm I'm really glad you did because because I've just said that you know I've just sort of almost criticised some people for missing the point. So I'm glad <laughs> I'm glad you didn't miss. The point. <laughs> 
Well, talk about horizons. Uh, you know, first of all, congratulations on, on, on planning a whole new uh, odyssey, as it were, because I'm sure that these these things take a lot of effort. So, mm-hmm. you know, talking about that, you, what do you what are you hoping to bring to audiences when you're you're stepping back out there? Well, the horizons is it's it is a, a space odyssey, and in a very real sense, it, it's got a lot of 2001 in it. Actually, it's mm-hmm. got a it. Um, it came from the initial intro is set to um, Sibelius, Sibelius's Fifth Symphony, Third Movement. Mm. And uh, that came from a conversation I'd had with a friend of mine who's a conductor called Daniel Harding. And uh, I asked him what Kubrick should have used <laughs> in 2001, almost as a joke. You know, what, what should he have done? What would Stanley, <laughs> you know, if I could have gone Stanley, you know, you shouldn't really use Strauss. You should have used it. And he said, he immediately said, Sibelius. And I'd not really listened to a lot of space. I like Mahler a lot. Mahler's in there as well. But um, so uh, this piece of music just, I thought it was magnificent. It's a hymn to nature. We mm-hmm. talked about that in the Stars film. It's, it's a hymn at one level to the, to the beauty of the Finnish landscape. It's in Finland, lakes with swans taking off a lake. And that's at one level what the music is about. But another level, it's about a deep spiritual connection to the beauty of nature, which Sibelius was very explicit about. And so the, the, I have this idea of telling the story of our emergence in the universe and reference in 2001, what we could become. Mm-hmm. So there's kind of a science fiction almost backdrop to it. Uh, I, I work with an artist called Eric Vernquist who is a, a Swedish artist, a graphic artist, who, who designs these beautiful futures, you know, O'Neill's, O'Neill colonies and Dyson spheres and all kinds of remarkable structures that could be there in our future if we don't make a mess of it here on Earth. And uh, so there's, he, he built some of these beautiful landscapes. And so the, the whole intro is Sibelius with basically a, a five-minute version of 2001 that yeah. I built and then and then the the show unfolds from there and all the elements the origin of life is in there we built a whole hydrothermal vent system in a tank and filmed it with like 8k cameras and things like that so it's we, we went completely over the top actually um uh, and and so at one level it's this it's a vision it's where we came from and what we can become mm. but also but the main scientific heart of it is uh, black holes because because the study of black holes is is the frontier of theoretical physics in terms of telling us what what the building blocks of reality are. So it's another thread that goes through the show. In particular, the suggestion that space and time are not fundamental, that they emerge from um, basically quantum entanglement, right? So so some kind of quantum field theory that lives on a boundary and and it's a dual description of nature. So space and time emerge from that picture. So I go quite deeply into black holes. We have uh, so-called Penrose diagrams of the inside of Schwarzschild and Kerr black holes. Kerr black mm-hmm. holes are spinning black holes, absolutely bizarre structures that uh, in, in principle, if you take Einstein at face value and if the black hole existed forever, there are an infinite number of universes inside a curved black hole. So, so these geometries are so utterly bizarre. The, so that there's so we have these huge images of the space-time geometries of the, the inside of black holes. Um, and this woven through it all, the story of our emergence and uh, uh, multiple universes, inflationary cosmology, and ultimately a, a reflection on what, as I said, what we can become and why, why we might be significantly more important in the in the universe than we uh, think at the moment, which is quite relevant actually as we speak, isn't it? We we uh, yeah we don't behave as a species as if we are valuable, not with that, notwithstanding our physical insignificance. And I think that so there's an element of that in the show. Hmm. Well, uh, you know, I can't wait to see you in Toronto when when you come later this year. Then. Uh, yeah, I have the thing I should one... say is that we, we, the whole show was designed um, for two things. One is it's designed for big arenas, so, so the whole all the graphics were built for the big shows that we're doing in the in the UK, which are 
you know, I think they're going to be 13, 14,000 people there. So they're wow. enormous. They're, um, what should I use? Feet or meters in Canada? <laughs> uh, meters. <laughs> the, the screens are about 30 meters wide. So the graphics mm -hmm. are designed for 30 meters by 10 meters, huge thing. And so the, as, as we're putting the biggest screen we can into the venue in Toronto, um, which is all LED. And so mm -hmm. the graphics have been built on that scale. And, and also the, the, the show has been designed such that it can be performed with an orchestra. So, so, the, so we bring in the, the full graphic version of the show, first of all, with the big LED screens and everything, which will be in Toronto and, and across Canada. And then uh, later on, we're beginning to put together now with Daniel Hardings, great conductor, we begin to try to put together the, with the full 120-piece orchestra playing Sibelius and Mahler and everything. So, so we might be back. <laughs> That's the plan <laughs> with with 120 musicians or something, wow. which would be cool. But we'll see. We'll see. How that, but yeah, but that's the thing to say. There, so it will be it will be um, spectacular because in a smaller venue, it you know we just put as much LED as we can in there, and it fills the place. So it'll it'll be it'll look great. That's amazing. Well, I know we're out of time, but the last thing I just wanted to ask quickly is, what does travel mean to you? Because you obviously get to travel a lot. Uh, I think we kind of touched around this last time I spoke to you, but I, I'm just curious these days, especially now that travel is kind of reopening mm -hmm. for you, what does it mean to be able to go around the world, not just for shows, but when, when you're actually doing these tours and everything else, uh, is that part of your lifestyle? It is. I mean, I mean, actually, interestingly, um, We'd already made, in filming terms, we've already made a decision to travel less because clearly we have to worry about the environmental impact impacts of the films. And um, the, the BBC, actually, BBC Studios, who made the film, we, we have a, 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 a complete offsetting policy. So the whole thing is mm -hmm. environmentally audited. And part of that is to be more efficient on the travel. Mm -hmm. And um, so, but you're right, um, film um, touring is... Touring's a an interesting one actually because it is again it's it's environmentally problematic, um, so we offset everything, but um, it's everybody can't do that, right? Mm -hmm. It turns out that if everybody just carries on doing what they're doing, then we don't have the capacity to offset all the carbon that we generate. Um, so it's uh, travel is one of those wonderful things, as you say. It I, I love it. Um, but I think as we go forward, we have to all think a little bit more carefully about how much we do it and how we do it. Um, so that's always, always on my mind. Well, thank you very much for the time. I really appreciate it. No, thank you. It's great to talk to you again. I can't wait to see you in Toronto. Actually, yeah, in I'm person. really looking forward to it. I haven't seen one of your shows before. 